The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMD's Alpha Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where you can offer clients access to local and international investments. A world where you can engage with clients meaningfully, backed by powerful data and insights with mobile-friendly technology. A world where you can build business efficiencies through scaled managed accounts and bulk reporting. And a world where you can get all the latest news, research and insights to spot the changes that really matter. Wealth is more than just money. It's about opportunity and progress. A world of opportunity awaits you at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantidis and the guest joining me here today to deep dive into Feasley has a degree in electrical and software engineering. So, you know, a little bit numerous, has been the lead singer in a band and was a four unit maths geek like myself. So, has probably been traumatized by the Coronius textbook we all had to do oh, when we did four unit maths. Right? Remember? <laughs> See, how funny is that reaction? Somebody who hasn't done four unit maths won't know that. But it, if you picture the worst design textbook ever with the worst font to make it look like it's an entire legal contract all the way through, that's what that textbook was. It was the most horrific things. So thank you so much for joining me on the show. Chris Coleman. Woo! Thank you. Thank you for that <laughs> intro. I sound pretty a lot more awesome than I thought I was. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's my job, right, as the host? <laughs> Absolutely. I, I do it. remember Jim Caronius. Right. I remember there was a mistake in the um, some of his answers in the back of the book and my <gasps> mate who also did four unit maths um, contacted him because the book said, if you find any mistakes in the book, please contact me. So he rang him and he had a chat <laughs> and he acknowledged that it was a mistake that my wow. mate had found. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. There's even, the man. there's even, you can Google Coronius and the, and the four unit mass textbook and there's whole sort of, you know, forums of people who've been scarred by <laughs> to use it. It's so funny. Like these little things, right? It's these little moments that imprint on us. Look, thank you so much for joining us on the show. I'm really keen to dive into the app, but as we always do, before we get started, we get to know you a little better as a user of technology. So share with us, what is your most used emoji? Do you even use emojis? Oh, yeah, probably overuse one more than any other, and that is the um, the wink smiley Okay. Put that on most of comments I post. Okay, <laughs> Just fair so enough. People know because there's no ability to um, convey a jovial nature in a post. So too many people yeah. take me too seriously if I don't put that little wink emoji. Right. I I view things like emojis as like a si- soundtrack. In a movie, the soundtrack he- helps you understand like what's the real tone, you know, what's really happening. And I think emojis are like that in text. It gives you a bit of tone indication. So yeah. I agree. I'm right there with you on that. I think it's really important. I even use, I'm using them far more in emails now than I ever used to as well because I just think it's a way to really help somebody get a feel. Um, for those of us that are a bit more jovial, I guess, too, we love that stuff. Yeah. Um, and so the second thing we want to know is if you had to delete all but three apps off your smartphone, which three would you keep? Well, I have to keep Gmail because it helped me communicate with everything. Um, yep. WhatsApp, definitely. I've got a lot of friend groups on WhatsApp. I okay. couldn't, couldn't do without that. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, this one's going to sound boring, but the MyGov ID app. 
Because otherwise I wouldn't be able to do my bears. <laughs> Any of my ATO interactions. Oh, I love it. Well, you should be pleased. You're pleased to know that that's not come up yet. So you've done well. You are a unique individual <laughs> with your need for that app. I think that's we already fantastic. worked that out. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> fantastic. All right. So let's dive into Feasley. Now, am I saying that right? Is there yes, a better way to say that's that? That's right. Perfect. So to, Some people, people pe- mispronounce and call it Freezily. I don't fr- know. Oh. They add an R in there. I don't know. It's like. Oh, that sounds like a Batman villain or something. Something in a can you can spray (laughs) on something to cool it down. Yeah, or or weird frozen cheese or something that you squeeze in a can or something like that, right? So for those who haven't heard of it before, um, I'm sure some will, but in the audience, if they haven't heard before, let's take it up a little level and get a feel for what category does it fall under? Like is it, you know, where does it fit in the sort of advice tech app space? Okay, well, it can be used at two levels. It's it's basically a... Financial practice revenue management system. Yeah, and and it can be used at the one level where it purely just translates all the data from all the different supplier files or su- provider revenue files and gets it into a a normalized format in its database, and then from there it can export it to whatever system we want, or can be used for the client and their own internal purposes. Yep. So we can export to four integration partners at the moment. So okay. Zeppo, Fin365, Advice Intelligence, and I Comply Too. Yep. Okay. And if and if you were to export at that point, you're talking at a sort of per client level. Is that really what you're saying? So it's connecting to an individual client record or? It's basically, no, it'll be the consolidation of a whole month or whatever their period okay. is, if it's two weeks or whatever. Yep. All that data for all the clients, it yep. just... They just hit a submit button once they've finished entering all the statements for a month, and yep. then it goes off to their connected integration partner. Okay. So I think there's going to be a whole lot of listeners who are advisors in practices who have never experienced the joys of revenue management <laughs> for financial advice. So I think we've got an opportunity to educate them on how the, how how much sympathy they need to demonstrate to the poor person in the practice who's dealing with this. So yes. for those of you who don't understand, what imagine with your banking, instead of being able to log in online and you've got your banking, imagine if your bank just sent you once a month an email with a CSV attached and when you opened that, it just had all this data in it. That's effectively, isn't it, what's happening with revenue statements from whether it's an insurer or or a platform provider. They send us this data in a sort of, a raw sense, don't they? So that's, that's what right. we all get. Yep. Yeah. And it's usually in their proprietary format. Yeah. So if you Which, decided to do it manually, you you spend a lot of time in Excel copying columns over and switching them around and changing certain values. And yeah, it's, yep. it's a yep. real mess to do it manually. It is. An, and bless their cotton socks, despite the fact that this has been something that's been around for decades, right? It's always been difficult. Um, they all use different names for things. So some yeah. might be an ongoing fee and some's an annual and some's that like it's, they've, it's almost like there's these nasty gremlins in all of these big institutions coming up, up with as many ways as possible to make the job of consolidating this data as hard as possible. Um, That's it's right. certainly Yeah, right? It does seem a little evil. Okay, and so these- And Feasley's job is to make that go away. Just it, it handles all the gremlins for you. You just drag and drop a file and it, it it's all the gremlins out. out and sorts them awesome. in order. Okay, so the processing function then is the files come in, which still would happen, so you get these files sent to you by the- or you download them from the provider for some of them. You have to yep. get extracted. Some get emailed, them. some get downloaded, downloaded from yep. their website. And then presumably they get uploaded, uh, dragged into Feasley. Is that right? So we sort That's of upload right. them yep. into Feasley. All right. So talk me through what happens then. What are the steps after that? Feasley will automatically look, even without naming the file in a particular way or anything, Feasley will examine the content of the file through this AI component we've built and work out what provider it's from based on the, purely on the content. You don't have to tell it that it's from AMP or MLC or anyone, and it just go, oh, that's an AMP, such and such format. And then it applies the correct translator for that particular format, and then okay. it translates the data and stores it internally. Okay. So, so some that systems, is- they do require you say, well, this is an MLC file, and you've got to click from the drop-down, choose MLC, and then if there's multiple formats within MLC, you've then got to go, oh, it's a... MLC XYZ format. Right. Okay. Yeah. And this is particularly, um, I, I sort of glimpsed that on the website and what caught my attention about that is uh, we're all aware of all of the 
sales and mergers and takeovers and all sorts of things going on. <laughs> yeah. Once again, bless their cotton socks in the industry at the moment. And one of the victims of that is revenue management because suddenly it changes or it's slightly different or the timing, like all sorts of things get messed with when these big deals um, at a high level go on. And so I was curious about that AI, AI function that might sort of help smooth that out a little for people That's so right. that there's less clunkiness and files getting rejected and that sort of stuff. Yeah, that's that's exactly what it can do. It makes that much easier. And we actually introduced something uh, some time back where to handle those exact mergers because oftentimes they'll merge and then they might keep the file the same format, but it's like one path going into TAL, I think yep. it was. Exactly the same format. But all the revenue now has to go into towel rather than one path. Right. So we added this component that went, okay, well, treat it exactly like it's one path, but redirect all the revenue down into towel now instead of into one path because now yeah. they're no longer. Yeah, exactly. So, And it's there's just going to be more and more of that um, because, of course, it, it's like anything what's going to happen is a whole lot of them are consolidating and then they're going to split and then they're going to – like it's it's never ending. This is That's not right. like yeah, – it never just happens once, right? No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, so the data's all in there. Um, it's been loaded up. Then, w- you know, in terms of what a practice might be doing then, and let's just talk a small practice for now because I know there'll be another layer then from mm-hmm. a dealer group perspective, but from a small practice's sense, what are they then doing once that data's uploaded? Okay, so if they've got a connection with Zeppo or one of the other integration partners, mm-hmm. then basically um, all their reporting and all their compliance stuff is done via that partner. Yep. So easily in that case, it's just acted as the um, the normalizer of the data and, and taking that load from all those different formats that we're talking about, getting it into a central database and then yep. sending it off to the Zeppos of the world. And all the reporting and the compliance gets done over on, on that side. Okay. And, and that's where I was saying there's two um, two levels of Feasley. The other f- level is where you don't do so much, where you may not have an integration partner, and then you start doing uh, further work in Feasley. And that's okay. where we do um, things like raising RCTIs for advisors and um, doing all the fancy reports for, based on the client lists and stuff like that. And, yep. And bra- obviously breaking it down into um, cars, Yep. Corporate authorized representatives. Yep. Okay. And and basically, it's using a um an accounting system that's built into Feasley to do all the um financial side of those things and managing okay. those invoices. Okay. And so that might be like you mentioned, Carcel. It might be that this is used for. And in fact, there's a few of those, aren't there, right now, where there's sort of one broad license, but there's a couple of businesses under it because they're sort of consolidated some small boutique practices, you know, and they're coming under one. And so this would then let them split things. That's um, right, yeah. You can have multiple them. cars and each car can have multiple advisors. Okay. Okay. And so then as so so that I can imagine that, then the person doing the initial processing is loading up those files. Um and then do they have the opportunity? So let's say we they've you've set up in Feasley the automation in terms of okay, we're we're using that, you know, the RCTIs and all of that is happening. Is there an opportunity then in between for them to go, yes, that's okay to go? I'm comfortable with that information. How does that work in terms of, you know, layering how that can get sent out. Ah, uh, okay. So, uh, yeah, that can then uh, – we've got a workflow system built. It's an accounting system. We've got a workflow system. So we can mm-hmm. configure it so that it, once it, you do an end-of-period processing, it, it can generate all the invoices and then you can review it and then you can we can configure it to actually Tick. automatically email those out. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. okay. So for that a, big, um, a big dealer group, say, with lots of cars and lots of advisors, yeah, that's yeah. that's definitely necessary. If you've got a small practice with one or two, they can just download the PDFs and email it to the guy who's sitting across the desk. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Throw it at them. Yeah. (laughs) Perfect. So then for, say, their own AFSL, then I'm guessing that the primary user really is just the person, whether it is the accountant or the principal or whoever it is that's sort of loading up those files. Are they really the primary user? Do you find anybody's use, like, is there any reason that the advisors use it as much or anybody else in the practice? Uh, not at this stage, no, but that's something one of the clients had mentioned to us a while ago that, um, yeah, maybe rather than sending everything to the advisor, maybe they can get online in Feasley themselves and actually see yeah, okay. the reports online and they can go back in history as well then. They yep. might have been sent something 
two months ago and they've lost it. So if they could get back on, the, yeah, okay. get on the system themselves. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so to that end, then the, like the end client, as in the end, you know, the uh, public, the consumer, then this is sort of never reaches that far. This is very much a within practice solution. Yes, that's yep. right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. It'll be usually be a um an admin person operating it. It won't yep. so much be the um advisor themselves. Yeah. Okay. There are some that do that, but most of them will have an admin person that maybe they also do their accounting and pay their bills and that, and they also been given the role of revenue processing. Yeah, okay. And how about um how about then, you know, for <laughs> like the, one of the biggest issues, it doesn't matter what system we're talking about and what function it forms, but going from one to another, right? That minute we make the decision to go from what a tool, you know, A to B. How are yeah. you finding that when people cuz clearly most practices have this or or their deal group does and so somebody's going to be if they make the decision to go with Feasley they're going to be coming from somewhere somewhere else. How do you guys manage that? What do you find are the things that people can do in advance to help them make that easier? Yeah. Um so if it's someone who's going to be using the full system uh and with invoicing and everything, then what we normally set up is a a client feed f- from a client data feed from yep. e- typically X plan or um, we're establishing one now from Advice Intelligence as well, where those platforms, those CRMs can give a daily cl- or a nightly um, dump of their client data set. Yep. And then when we um, get provider statements in, we have the names already in the database to match to. So I can do name matching. Okay. It only has to do each one, like each one once. So you get a... AMP file and you do the matching, it's done once. You only have to do this name match again if a new client's added. Yep. And then okay. so then they'll appear uh to and you get it'll give you a choice of names that look similar to the name you, you're yep. trying to match to. And it's usually yeah, pretty okay. accurate. So yeah, you just click and go, Yep, that's the one. Yeah, okay. That's all pretty visual. You get your choices on the right hand side and go, Yeah, Bill Smith, and there's a Bill Smith there, and there's only if there's only one on Bill Smith, well you pretty confident that's the dude so you accept yep. and away you go yep okay um and so then in terms of then for example so one of the things that um historically we've just not been as strong on in advice because well i don't really have a good because but <laughs> because we we're using what we would call commission systems right so in the mm-hmm. old days it was all about product and so it came when it came um but that's a then, naughty word now to commission. it is right and <laughs> and whereas in this environment then i think Pipeline management and, you know, being aware when the fee does get paid, you know, all those sort of things is something we're going to have to do more and more of because more practices are getting paid directly, for, as an example, right? So they're, they're charging a fee and it's getting paid, those sort of things. So I guess I'm curious about whether it exists now or down the track, you guys, in terms of, you know, can somebody put into the system, hey, I've I've quoted this to that particular client where we're waiting for that money to come in. Like those sort of things, are they on the development path or do they exist already? Yeah, they're actually there already. You can actually raise invoices from within Feasley for that. So okay. they can raise their invoice to go to their clients and they can also set up a like a yearly schedule so that on the 25th of September every year, yep. you it'll get a reminder that they've got to you know, raise that. Due yeah. for whatever, okay. And there's also a notes section they can put in with each client, they can say, oh, I told them next year I'm going to up it by 2% or something or 20% for inflation <laughs> yeah. purposes. <laughs> yeah, okay. And so the invoice that goes out is is just effectively paper or is it or is it something that they can, you know, click oh, on a link to pay? It's or a how PDF does... at okay. this stage, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, so it's not something that's like a, the equivalent of, say, a Stripe or – or square where the where the individual could transfer from within the tool. So you guys aren't at that point where a client can sort of, you know, zap money from a link. Um, Not for yet, a fee. no. Okay. But okay. a lot of clients have like an easy debit set up already, right? So they right, just okay. continue to use that. To and, use that, yep. yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, because it is one of the things that I think will be. It's not very common right now, but I do think a few years, you know, down the track, there'll be more people doing, you know, programs that last. Six months, and so the payments are spread over, you know, three equal payments. So, you know, like these sort of things, and we're yep. going to need more and more tools that help us do that without just triggering a task to remind us to send the invoice to follow up. That you know, like ah, <laughs> that's just yeah. crazy, crazy talk. So, I expect those are the sort of things that'll be coming down the track. Yeah, well, with our 
process management like workflow engine that's built underneath Feasly. We've we've used that in a number of other products that we've the step ahead's developed over many years. Yeah. And yeah, it's quite flexible. It can automate lots of things. We can we can actually go into a visual process editor and describe the process and the steps and what it's got to do here and have decision points where, oh, this didn't work or if this was a set up, go this other way. And yeah, so we can visually program the whole process and okay. fire, get that to automatically fire off every year or three months, whatever. Yeah, okay, mm. okay. And so I'm expecting then that you probably are indifferent about whether it's advice income or it's, say, mortgage broking or other things. So if a practice is sort of multi That's right. Yeah, we can do okay. mortgage commissions or uh, insurance or investment. Okay. Fees. Okay. Yeah. So it's sort of, and and I'm assuming the tool then just copes with that. It's like, well, it's seen those sort of things enough, and it and it can process those things. So that's, that's a bit right. of a positive, so that you're not trying to handle that in multiple places because that can get a little yes, clunky and difficult. Right. In fact, we we designed it from day one to be like that. It was for a lot of the legacy systems, they were hooked into, um, you know, fund commissions. Yeah. In fact, we call. The, instead of calling them advisors internally and feasibly, they're called agents. Okay. An agent could be an advisor, could be a broker in, in yep. mortgage terms, or yep. it could be whatever you want. So we went with this generic agent term, and agent just acts on behalf of uh, someone else. So yeah. Yeah, okay. Which makes sense. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And in terms of then, I mean, fee disclosure is this big task now we're all tasked with mm-hmm. is that um and the need to do an fds and you know and all those sort of things is that then um how you see your integrations with other tools can then use your, your data and it feeds into the other tool that provides that that's right all functionality? Our, our four okay. integration partners provide all that side of things at the moment yeah. yeah okay okay and so that's part of i mean i'm imagining a key part so so hence so let's talk through those so you mentioned advice intelligence and x plan so you're doing no we're not going we, we're getting the client data feed from, from x plan but we don't have okay. a we don't have data going back to XPlan at this stage. Okay. Okay. But cool. Of the four, we do send data to. It's Advice Intelligence, Fin three six five, Zeppo, and I comply too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so the fact that it's, I mean, the fact that you're doing Zeppo means it's, there's probably um, a whole lot of others because Zeppo does sort of talk to a whole lot of other tools. Then that can give it some extra grunt in that sense. Um, That's right. It's got all yeah. the Power BI um, built in, so. Yeah. Whatever they want to do once they're in Zeppo land, they can yeah, yeah go okay. to town. And how, like in terms of, uh, you know, other integrations, is there any others you're working on or is there anything else that's sort of down the track that's coming um, in terms of your integration list? We've been in talks with some others. Um, mm-hmm. They're the main ones at the moment that, yep. that are live. Um, yeah, we've, in the last little while, we've been really focusing on that whole extra the completion of that revenue management side so we've been that's where we've come up you know the rcti generation right and that yep. side of things so yeah that's been our focus that's, yeah so, okay yeah yeah okay and look i think um those tasks automating those tasks is really important because it, it just doesn't require any insight <laughs> so it's <laughs> it's crazy that we do some of these things manually because there's no human interaction really required in that sense. Like we're not going to provide some nuance, right? It's um, really structured, repetitive, yeah. um, happens every month. So I'm a big fan of anything that automates those. In terms of the cl- then practices then you do work with, is there, is there a, a size, a type or a way they approach things that works better for, you know, with you guys or, you know, is there anything that it really suits and then others you're like, that just doesn't suit us? Uh, no, we've, Anyone who didn't, we didn't suit, we've done our best to change to suit them. Yep. Okay. (laughs) Okay. It's a great marketing model, that one. (laughs) (laughs) The non niche niche. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I love it. So um, I love it. Yeah. There's some, yeah, really large deal groups and then there's small practices. Um, We also uh, deal with um, aggregators that we don't deal with their clients directly. Yep. So they do the processing on behalf of their clients and they use Feasley to do it. Okay. Okay. And it, awesome. it's set up specifically for that. So you can outsource to, say, the Philippines or India and all of the clients that they have under their books are all um, 
available from a drop down menu or from a menu on the main screen. Yeah. So they, they want to go in and do client A or practice A, they just click and then everything from then on there, they're dealing with client A. Okay. And we also put mechanisms in. In that case, when when an agency or an aggregator like that's downloading lots of files from for lots of different clients, there's always the opportunity for them to accidentally upload to the wrong yes. practice. Yeah. So in those cases, we do support embedding the name of the practice in the file name. Okay. And then if it it it, it determines what practice the file is for, and you've, if you've accidentally tried to upload it to the wrong practice, it'll it's go, like, uh-uh. oh, this looks yeah. like it's for these guys. <laughs> and then they go, oh, yeah, okay. whoops. <laughs> awesome, because that is easy to do. When when you're on a roll of doing those sort of tasks, yeah. you can get into drone sort of <laughs> repetitive <laughs> behaviour, which, which can be bad. Is yeah, there... you don't want to go uploading the wrong data and the wrong no. practice. Oh, <laughs> God, awful. Um, is there any features that you think um, – Adver- you know, are gems, but people often don't get to the point of using? Like, are there any sort of unsung heroes in terms of the features that you feel like users could get some extra benefit out of? There are some reporting facilities in Feasley itself. Yep. yep. Um, but again, because most of the users are going through an integration partner where they're, all the reporting's done with them, yep. it doesn't really get used a lot. Okay. But there are some smaller clients that are coming online that aren't going to go through an integration partner, and so they'll, they'll probably use those. Yeah, okay. Yeah, a lot more. And I guess, um, you know, that's where, you know, it's another example. You talked about the automation of the RCTIs going out, um, but, you know, the best systems even automate the report so that then it's like you get nudged and you go, oh, there's a new report. It's, it's not something you've got to task yourself to then go in and check it out. You know, these once we can get to the point where the systems are nudging us to to monitor and watch, you know, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, you know, that really feels like we're empowered uh, and, <laughs> and and not just constantly looking at a massive task list that we've got to, mm. we've got to act on. Awesome. Yeah, um, we and want so, the robots to take over so we don't have right. to do anything. I was about Hang to say, like, I'm a bit of a fan of the robots taking over some of the stuff. Like, would you please do that thing? I need you to take over that. Um, so what about developments? Talk to me about what's on the path going forward, whether it's, you know, in the near future or where you see things going a bit further down the track that's more of a wish list sort of thing that's I'd love it to get to this point. Yeah. Um, we're doing some optimizations at the moment on – when when you're client matching, there yep. can be um, if you get a very large dealer group with like thirty or forty thousand clients, um, when you first, as I was saying before, when you first upload a new statement for a provider, you've got to match, and so to do the the lookup to compare each name with all those thirty thousand can be quite a burden for a computer to do. So um, yeah, we've we've already. We haven't released it yet. We've already um, brought down the timings on those quite significantly. Yeah. Fantastic. Because yeah. it's not something people are as used to these days, is it, where you hit enter and then there's a massive delay? People are so used to things happening immediately that whereas I remember, you know, the bad old days when you'd, I mean, it was even DOS, you know, and all that, when when you'd sort of do something and you'd go away for 20 minutes. Oh, like, yeah. <laughs> He'd come back. Don't have three coffees. Right. And the problem was if you hadn't quite got the directions right, you've wasted the 20 minutes as well because you've then got to correct it. But, yeah, okay. So, and, and this is sometimes it's a lot of data, isn't it? Like it really is each – it's not – I think when people, you know, sort of think about that data, all they think about is the number of, say, policies. But per per policy and per revenue run, there's exactly. this big list of, of information that's provided, um, useful or not, that mm. you guys are processing. And we – you often get problems where the names aren't exact. So it's not a simple matter of doing an exact match because that would be very quick. We have to yep. do what's called these fuzzy matches. Okay. Because uh, someone might be officially called Robert, but they told their product or the advisor was always calling them Bob and they signed them up to MLC, some MLC product as Bob. And then MLC sending through Bob and we've got them down the system as Robert. Right. So we've had to introduce this um, fuzzy nickname mapping um, system where it actually okay. goes, oh, well, if we're looking for Bob, we're also going to look for a Robert. And if we're looking for Edward, we're going to look for Ted or an Eddie. And, and yeah, so you can okay. see the um, multiplication of the computing effort involved in doing name matching when you're not just trying to look for exact matches. Absolutely. And yeah. what about, now I didn't ask before, what about 
client groups like you've got a family that you service and there's can you is there ability to sort of group them together in the yeah. system yeah, yeah. okay that okay. comes so, through the if x plan data set will come yep. through and that has that information in okay. it okay it's about the groups okay yeah, and so the all of that captured trust, yeah everything yeah, because yeah. it's, I mean, we, we mentioned earlier that it was, you know, there's this, you know, one company takes over another company. That's one example. But then the the lovely product providers then randomly do these product upgrades where suddenly everybody in this platform gets shifted to that platform or whatever. The, <laughs> like this stuff is <laughs> yeah. going on all the time. Mm. So so all of this is much harder than than it sort of feels like it should be, to be honest, um, in terms of the way they make it. So that makes sense. Anything else further down the track that you think you guys will be adding or 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 sort of developing into the system? We've got a lot of things in the backlog. Yeah, um, okay. I probably should have looked that up before <laughs> I came to do this interview. But it We've sounds got like some great things, yeah, in the pipeline. Yeah, is, is, is a lot of it in reacting to what people are sort of requesting? Is that part yes, of a, uh, what you do? Like it's like, yeah. hey, it'd be great if it did this. And so then you guys go through a process of prioritizing when you can do those. Is that, yeah, that, is that that's fair? It. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. A um, lot of them but, usability issues. Some of them are. Um, downright you know we really need to be able to do this because right. it saves so much time yeah 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 um and look it is a tough it's a tough thing to get attention of in a practice because as a rule there's one person doing this so when you're looking for efficiencies in a practice this sort of stuff doesn't get as much attention as you might think because it's only one poor soul <laughs> That's suffering through this. The rest of the team are blissfully right. ignorant about how hard it is. Yes, um, that's right. Yeah, right. So it's it's often one of those things that's that's not actually given much attention, to be honest. Um, you know, as long as everybody gets paid and the money comes in, you know, there's sort of there's not as much attention as there should be. So so I do I do like the idea of streamlining these things because it is a it's so repeatable, a lot of this functionality. That's um, right, yeah. You know, so so, and I guess that's where I guess you guys have been folding in things like the AI stuff. Is well, let's make sure that anything that that some simple AI could do, it does, mm. um, rather than exactly. forcing the user to. Like yeah. we can't AI the trans the actual translation of the data. Yep, because that's just AI is not an exact science, and if you get no. revenues wrong, that's it's really really bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If the yeah, computer suddenly sure. thinks, you know, this is that when it's not, this is yeah. too, way too risky. Yeah. But the classification of a document to say this is a colonial first state, first wrap file, that it's dead on and it, it's either that or it's not. Because if it's slightly different, the AI will go, no, nah, I don't know what that is. Yeah, yeah. And and that's the thing I think um, we probably don't consider enough is simp- like, and when I say that simple AI, like the application of, like if if a human would just scan down something to try and identify if it's a type, well, an AI can do that. Mm. Like you don't need a human to do that. You know, it's not, if you're, if you're just you're scanning for something and the, like you say, look for first wrap. Oh, okay, it's there. <laughs> like, mm. okay, well, tech can do that. Um, yeah. For sure. Um, perfect. All righty. Is there anything we've missed in terms of the functionality or what the system can can do? I uh, don't think so. Um, sort of key things. It sounds like it's sort of you've picked a real niche in terms of solving a problem. Yeah. Um, and it, like you say, there's been legacy systems that have done it for some time, but you guys have sort of stepped in with it, something from – it's like a clean, you know, from scratch, so you can sort of respond to the way the, the That's market right. is now. We didn't have yeah. the burden of that legacy code base. We could just – Develop this completely modern, really well architected management system. For- yeah, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. All right, Advice Explorers, if you'd like to find out more about Feasley and you are the poor soul in the office that's handling some of these <laughs> revenue statements or you know the person and you feel sorry for them um, and want to find out more, then the website link is in the episode show notes and I've also included Chris's LinkedIn details and I'm sure he'd be happy for you to reach out and he will point you in the right direction to find out more. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on the show, Chris, and, and sharing with us what um, all of us need because the practices need to get paid and need to know, you know, all their data information, but it's probably one of the less focused on sector of the advice tech space. So I really appreciate your time. No problem. Thanks for having me. So are you a current user of Feasley? I'm betting you probably aren't only because a lot of our listeners are advisors or power planners or support staff, as opposed to the uh, people who might be processing um, payments within a practice. So far less of you will be nodding away. Yes, people, Peter, we do use this tool because you won't be actually performing the function um, that the tool delivers on. However, 
I think it'd be great if you've ever been through the process of moving from one of these tools to another, you know, please share your experience on the Ensemble platform. These functions um, are, like we were saying before, a bit of an unloved portion of practice management, but are fundamental. Uh, And so sharing that experience and the insights you have, whether it's with Feasley or another tool, I think would be invaluable. And of course, if you have shifted to Feasley, then share that experience and, and, you know, any insights you could bring to other users out there. Now, as for my thoughts, I'd actually like to throw down a bit of a challenge to all of those out there who aren't in practice management, revenue processing parts of a practice or a dealer group. So if you're any of those other things that I talked about, you might be an advisor or um, or a power planner or a support staff, somebody not involved in that sort of revenue processing function, I'd love you to take the opportunity to ask how that gets done in the practice or the dealer group. What's the tool they use? What's the process they go through? What gets in the way? You know, is there anything you do in your work that could make their life easier? Like, just get curious, find out how these things work, how often, what, you know, what are the challenges they face? Every time we can get insight into how somebody else is working and what works or doesn't for them, we can all collectively improve. And there may be a single thing you could change in the way you operate that could save them 10 tasks every month. Like, we just don't know, right? I mean, things like advisor codes and, and you know, which client we put under which advisor because all those things can overcomplicate some of these roles. And so you may find that the reason you've set those up is something that isn't as necessary and it can all be processed at the revenue management system. Who knows? Ask the question, right? Just check in with those people and just say, I'm just curious. I'd love to know. I just heard this podcast episode and I'd love to understand which tool you, you're using to do revenue management, right? The more we can understand all the elements of how we work together to deliver for the public, then the better collectively um, that service can be. Now, as you know, there's only one skill we need to become bionic advisors. I just mentioned it, didn't I, folks? That's avid curiosity. So, To help you build that habit, today's Curiosity Corner app actually came up because I was looking for a particular type of diagram for somebody. I was trying to represent something in a better way, in a simpler way, and I came across this tool called Sankey Art, uh, which looks as weird as it sounds. You can find it at sankeyart.com. The spelling of that is S-A-N-K-E-Y-A-R-T, and Basically, if you've not heard of it before, a sand key diagram, this is a type of diagram, just like a pie, pie chart's a type of diagram, right? A sand key diagram is basically a visualization of data or you could think of it as cash flow, right? Moving through some points. So basically, it's moving from left to right, right? So it's going from one set of values to another. Um, The things that are being connected or collated together are called nodes and the point where they connect are called links. So as an example, you could think of it as showing in almost a flow diagram like rivers coming together and then splitting apart again. The rivers could be a couple's income coming in from two separate places, but then it gets split into all the different places they've got to apply that income, right? So it's something that really easily but concisely actually captures that sort of consolidation of cash flows or balance sheets. I've seen it done for balance sheets, all sorts of things that just break it apart in a far more visual sense. So this is a tool that is, you know, basically you enter in like a little spreadsheet, the data, you tell it what things connect to what, you even uh, can pick the color of those little rivers that flow from left to right, um, and it produces the diagram for you, and you can then extract it as a PNG or a JPEG. Um, so it sort of lives in that middle ground between a um, a pure graph that we might do, like a line graph, versus a designed image that we then add the client's details in because we really like the way that image works. So this sort of sits in the middle um, of that sort of tool. It was once you play with it a bit, it's really quick to pull together. And I really like it for that, helping somebody get insight into their cash flow because the thing it does is the the width of the river. So if you think about from the left to right, two rivers coming together in one point, then the width of that river is defined by the dollar value. So if one of the incomes is bigger than the other, it's wider. If one of the 
places it goes, one of their expenses is bigger than the other, it's wider. So they instantly can look and go, whoa, that's a really big expense, right? So this is something that really gets across um, insights really quickly for somebody that's not particularly mathematical. So check it out. Um, Let me know if you've ever used a Sankey diagram before or you like the tool. It's not flash or crazy, folks. It's really that simple. It's just going to create these types of diagrams. That's all it does. Um, but I just it caught my eye and it solved a problem for me, so I thought it might help. All righty. That's all we've got for this week. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each Friday. And, you know, if this has sort of sparked some ideas for you and the way you want to challenge things or or do things different in your practice and you feel like you need to get your team together to sort of get that brainstorm humming, then I'd love to facilitate a brainstorm for you. That could even cl- include a team building session so we can help to build their curiosity as a, as a real muscle going forward um, and then bring them together to make innovation just an automatic part of what you guys do together. So if that's of interest, please reach out to me on LinkedIn um, at forward slash Peter MD. That's P-E-I-T-A-M-D. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, advice explorers, stay curious. <laughs>